This morning we talked about all sorts of things that the 2009 Lund Declaration has influenced and touched on, but we didn't talk too much about the direct impact of the Lund Declaration itself. What difference did it make? If we hadn't have met here six years ago, how different would things be? Uh, so we're going to get on to some, uh, sh some more of our showcase interviews, and we'll get on to with particular stakeholders' perspectives. But we're going to start by flagging up the connections, the very obvious ones, with Horizon 2020 and those grand challenges we keep mentioning on, the responses to society. And our man who's going to do the digging is the head of the EC's joint programming sector. Please welcome Dr. Jörg Niehoff. So for once, not a presentation on complexities of error nets in Arctic 185, but on something different. Perhaps allow me one remark on the session we had this morning. Um, it was a lot about alignment, and if you look into the Oxford Dictionary, there is alignment in the sense of geometrical alignment, and I think that was a lot how the discussion on alignment in JPI start. But the other part of the definition is about mutual support, political support, and I think what became very clear this morning is if we don't have that political support and the mutual support between the actors, we don't get anywhere either. So, what happened since Lund 2009 and what I try to present in the next minutes without standing between your and your flight is what has changed in Horizon 2020 compared to previous framework programs. Mm. Okay, good. We are getting there. Eh. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, good. I thought it's the same. Okay, good. Sorry. So, Lund had a clear focus on moving research from topic research to those addressing grand challenges, involving all actors and stakeholders, but in the small print were also other things. A sound research infrastructure in Europe, frontier research, modification of financial regulation to simplify the research that we are conducting at European level. If we look today at the framework program, of course, we have done a lot of work on that end. We have the first framework program that pulls together a number of previous programs into a single program that addresses the whole innovation chain up to from frontier research to innovation that has dedicated instruments that address stakeholders in particular for the innovation part, fast track to innovation, the SME instrument, the possibility to co-fund procurement. And these are things that are important, I think, on the impact side. On the other side, we have for the first time a different, uh, dedicated pillar on societal challenges that is a key of the entire framework program. We have simplified access. I think everybody acknowledges the progress that we have made so far in simplified rules. We have a single set of rules across the entire framework program. We have a very limited number of instruments that we use, and I think the IT systems that the applicants use nowadays are really state of the art. If you look at the budget, more than 35% go direct to societal challenges, energy, environment, health, etc. But of course, the other pillars are equally important in addressing these challenges. The key enabling technologies are a challenge as such, but at the same time, they also provide solutions to many, many of the societal challenges. So if you take the energy challenge, materials for energy applications are in the key enabling technologies. They are not part of the energy challenge. At the same time, the excellent science pillar with the ERC with Marie Oscar Curie, prepares the grounds to have the researchers of the future and have the infrastructures and the um, science in place that we need to address these challenges. Implementation is now in year number three very soon. We have done a big load on receiving, evaluating proposals. That is a big machinery. Many of you have been involved as evaluators and I think especially the fact that those that run evaluations at national level participate in our evaluations and state that what we do is first-class evaluations and a big, very efficient machinery, that is a big compliment that we get there. I think also on the side, grant, uh, time to grant, we are on a very good way. We are now at 93% within the eight months that we have committed to fulfill. The main change, of course, in terms of how we address grand challenges, societal challenges, is at the level of the work programs. So the work programs today are not any longer prescriptive in terms of clearly identifying the research needs and basically prescribing what kind of research project we want. They are open, 
they are very strongly focused on the entire innovation cycle and they allow very much bottom-up proposals where we select those that are very strong in impact and exploitation. To make that a little bit concrete, two examples. The one is from the challenge climate action environment, resource efficiency and raw materials. Under FP7, we had basically individual ecosystems that were addressed. Towards the end of FP7, we at least moved to the extent that we said we allow the researchers to address any ecosystem they want, but it still was driven by curiosity, better understanding the problems. Today, the work program clearly invites applications, proposals that provide solutions, non-technical innovation, technical innovation, involvement of public investment, involvement of private investment, large-scale demonstration, really here finding solutions that immediately show impacts for the citizens and for the economy. So really employment, economic impacts from the environmental challenge is a key to this. For the health challenge, again, we had a focus under FP7 on specific diseases. We didn't always receive proposals for the diseases we wanted, or not good enough proposals. Under Horizon 2020, we are really looking at the bigger picture of understanding health, aging, etc. Which means you have proposals coming in, again competing on a different number of diseases, and we pick the ones that have the best impacts, show the best potential. It doesn't come without a downside. We have a substantial oversubscription here. In many calls, we are only able to fund proposals with a score of 15. That is, of course, a very disappointment for the scientific community. And we still sometimes struggle to address certain specific policy needs that we have or specific research needs that we see for certain um, uh, diseases. Moving, last but not least, to the part that deals directly with public-public partnerships. We have a number of Arctic 185 initiatives and um, the one on metrology that started under FP7 was at the beginning something very much on research needs of the National Metrology Institutes. The new program that started last year is something where a large part of the budget, more than 40%, is directly targeted at societal challenges, which means it involves the end users and they define the needs in terms of metrology research for health, for environment, for energy. In addition, they have large elements of the program that are directly dedicated at capacity building, at standardization, norms, etc. So the entire focus of the program has shifted from research needs of the metrology community to deliver impacts to the society. The second example, EDCTP, clinical trials with a focus on sub-Saharan Africa, that is a program as such that is totally focused on societal challenges. And last but not least, within what we do to support the JPIs, we also, I think, have quite changed our approach. Of course, there is the basic support that we have provided over the years with the coordination support actions, and I think the JPIs have used that very well to build the structures, now move into directions like widening what we heard this morning. But we also see the impact that we have at the co Fund. We allow here really the research funders to come together and have a different scale and scope in their actions. Under FP7, we have the usual eight to nine million call budget of an error net, and we move towards 29 million, 30 million on average in Horizon 2020. We see that we come from consortia that in the past had 10, 12 research funders to more than 20 research funders that come together, which means in the context of the JPIs, but also in the context of the other aeronets we are funding, we are really here moving to a scale and scope that makes it attractive also then to have third countries in. We see that almost each of the aeronets today has Canada, South Africa, other third countries in. So I think we have seen a lot is changing at the level of the way we organize calls, we invite proposals, we have changed our approach towards public partnerships, but of course the real impacts on the challenges we're only going to see in in quite a few years. So as for the JPIs, where we can today only check if the structures are in place to make sure that they can hopefully deliver on that, we will also only see, not even with the midterm evaluation, but perhaps towards the final evaluation of Horizon 2020, if these things deliver on the societal challenges. With this, I think I've said enough, and I understood that the examples that we get now are practical examples from your projects. I think they will be more illustrative than what I can say. Thank you. Thank you.